and welcome back again to the video on fertility and pregnancy. And we're going to start out this video talking about exposures to toxic chemicals. Now we've talked a little bit about this in the previous videos, but just kind of to re-emphasize, uh, very important to be careful during pregnancy. And so one of the things that doctors advise is just eliminate all alcohol during your pregnancy, all tobacco, and of course, definitely any illicit drugs. So you have to remember that these drugs are not just affecting mom. They're also affecting the fetus because many of these drugs can pass through the placenta directly into the fetus. And just think about this. You know, this fetus is growing, it's developing, and at the same time, the neurological system, the cardiovascular system, all these different systems are developing. What's happening is these drugs are interfering with that healthy development, and of course, you don't want that to happen. So because of this uh, ability to cross the placenta, you can have all kinds of different malformations that happen with this fetus. So for instance, marijuana, it's the most common recreational drug that is used and also used during those reproductive years. So again, the mom might be okay with, hey, I'm going to stop taking marijuana because now I know I'm pregnant. Uh, but what if she's smoking marijuana and has no idea that she's pregnant? That becomes a big issue. And we know that that marijuana affects the fetal central nervous system. It can also reduce blood flow to the uterus and to the placenta. And remember, any blood flow is super important because what it's doing is it's carrying oxygen, it's carrying nutrients, and if we reduce that in any way, uh, there's going to be issues in fetal development, and then you may have uh, a preemie, uh, and you may have a low birth weight uh, child that's born. So it leads to poor fetal growth and increased risk preterm, low birth weight. Now there are other drugs too, obviously, psychoactive drugs like methamphetamines and cocaines and heroin and different types of opioids, uh, codeine even, and of course these also are going to slow down fetal growth and brain development and any of these types of drugs, and this is also tobacco and alcohol as well, can lead to physical and mental disabilities in the child. So over-the-counter medications can be very harmful too. So one of the things that mom has to be careful of and talk to her OBGYN about is what medicines are okay, what medicines are not okay. I know in the dark ages when I had kids, they basically said, you're not allowed to take anything. Now, of course, there's been a lot of research in all of those years and they're able to tell women now that there are certain medications that they have found aren't going to affect the fetus, aren't going to affect that pregnancy. And of course, that's very helpful to mom if she needs those medicines. Now, a lot of people have issues with the medical profession nowadays. And so you see a, more and more people switching to herbal remedies. But you have to be careful of these herbal remedies because they can have side effects too. Like for instance, a lot of people take St. John's wort for a cold, but what some people don't know is that St. John's wort is also a blood thinner, and so you have to be really careful, or primrose oil. It can be very helpful in a lot of things. I've seen primrose oil help a lot of people, and, but you have to be careful also because it can act as a blood thinner, and so that can cause damage to mom, it can cause damage to the fetus, and we've already talked about x-rays and any type of radiation, you just need to stay away from that, minimize it as much as possible, especially if you're working in a job where that is something that you do every day. Uh, for instance, an x-ray tech or a, a dental assistant. These are things that they're exposed to quite often. So you have to be very, very careful and take all kinds of precautions. Now food safety obviously is a big deal and listeria is a bacteria. It's a foodborne illness and it can be a real danger to pregnant women. And you can find listeria in unpasteurized milk and certain types of cheeses, especially like the soft cheeses that come from raw milk. Raw cabbage could carry this. 
Uh, and what it does is it causes you to feel like you have the flu, you're kind of sick and you feel super tired and you just don't feel like doing anything whatsoever. But the big deal is this could actually contribute to spontaneous abortion. So really, really uh, dangerous for the pregnant mom. So you want to be really careful with the foods that you eat while you're pregnant. You want to make sure that your milk is pasteurized and that you're thoroughly cooking your meats. Uh, that would include fish and beef and poultry. So one of the other things that we've talked about that's very important is uh, weight. And you want to make sure that you're gaining the appropriate amount of weight during pregnancy. So a lot of this also has to do with how much did mom weigh before she was pregnant. So what was her pre-pregnancy BMI, okay? And of course you want to keep a healthy body weight. Now, I know you're pregnant, you want to eat all the time because one of the things that nasty little hormone progesterone does is it stimulates your hunger drive and you just want to eat, 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 eat. And uh, you don't want to do that. that just is not a good idea because that can lead to all kinds of other things. So you have to try really hard in making sure that you just don't give yourself the excuse, well, I'm pregnant, now I can eat whatever I want. Although that's a lot of fun, but hey, you don't want to do that. There can be side effects. And one of the other issues is you don't want, again, not only to be overweight, but you don't want to be underweight because now there's going to be health issues with that as well for mom and for baby. We talked about obese women, and when a woman is uh, grossly obese, your infant has a much higher risk of birth defects. Uh, interestingly enough, they have a risk of dying earlier in life. Now, this could be epigenetics playing, because a lot of times when you have uh, an obese mother, you are also going to have obese children. And so is this mom passing down those obesity genetics? It's kind of nature versus nurture type of thing. Is she teaching them to eat like that? Do they have the genetics for that? Probably a little bit of both is going on. So again, you want to make sure that you're gaining the right amount of weight, but possibly for some women, they may be underweight before they get pregnant. So they're very skinny potentially not very healthy. If they don't gain enough weight during the pregnancy and have the right nutrition, you're looking at an infant that could be born with a low birth weight, could be born premature. And underweight women have, obviously, lower nutrient stores. And those nutrient stores, those are the things we're gonna to use to feed baby, okay? So if you already have lower nutrient stores, what are you gonna feed baby with? especially if you're not eating much, okay? And then, of course, we talked about these women don't have as much iron, which could lead to the spontaneous abortion. It could also uh, lead to other issues in the infant. Uh, and let's just go back just a step. One of the reasons why it's leading to issues is because, again, iron is necessary for mom for her to be able to carry oxygen. If mom doesn't have enough oxygen, she can't deliver enough of that oxygen to baby, okay? And baby's got to have a ton of oxygen while it's growing because all that oxygen is being used to make ATP. All that ATP is used for energy production. Lots of energy, lots of moving and shaking going on with this fetus, okay? Uh, the weight gain obviously is going to improve the outcome of the pregnancy. Okay, so nutritional status. So nu good nutrition, obviously, duh, you know, it's worth the effort. It's going to improve your pregnancy. It's going to improve the infant. Uh, it's going to prevent birth defects. And you don't want to, when it says don't restrict calories, now that, that doesn't mean go out and eat whatever the heck you want. It means don't be on a diet while you're pregnant, okay? So daily dieting is not a good idea, especially if you're restricting calories super low. So there's a lot of people who they go on a diet and all they eat is like a thousand calories a day. Now that is not recommended even if you're not pregnant, okay? The, those calories are typically too low to sustain a healthy body. And uh, if you're eating a thousand calories or less a day, 
obviously there's not enough calories for mom. How many calories do you think there's going to be left over for baby? And one of the things that, that mom's body is super duper good at is um, if there's something wrong and mom's body requires those calories, forget baby, okay? It's not going to happen. Uh, we're not going to give those calories to baby. Baby is out of luck, okay? Uh, we've talked about folate. We're going to talk about this again. But about 400 micrograms of uh, folate or folic acid are necessary a day. And again, what that does is it prevents birth defects. Now, when a uh, baby is originally forming, okay, so this is in the first trimester when it still looks like a little tadpole. When that baby is originally forming, uh, the brain and the spinal cord are all just this one long tube, and we call this a neural tube. And that neural tube will eventually, remember we talked about how it curls and curls under, that starts to become the brain, and then the rest of it is the spinal cord. But there are defects in that neural tube if during that growth period, mom doesn't have enough folate on board, okay? And so we can have those central nervous system defects. And what that does also is it increases the risk of premature or preterm delivery. Now, we also don't want to have low calcium levels. We've talked about iron, super important. Calcium levels need to be high also. That's what those multivitamins are all about. If you've looked at those prenatal vitamins, they have higher levels of things than any other vitamins. And that's because mom's not just taking vitamins for herself, she's taking vitamins to give to baby as well. And baby's body is forming, so obviously needs a lot of calcium, vitamin A, uh, all of those nutrients are important. Now, there's nutritional assistance that's needed many times for low-income families because when somebody is lower income, and I don't, I don't understand this, okay? I, I have never, ever, ever understood this. We subsidize all kinds of things as far as farming is concerned and food is concerned. Now, subsidized means that the government gives farmers money to produce particular crops. Okay, so that means you and me, the taxpayers, we pay taxes to the government, and then of course the government decides how to spend our money, okay? And one of the things the government decides how to spend our money on is they say, okay, there's an issue for farmers. Um, these farmers, you know, they don't make a lot of money, okay? Farming is a hard job, and farmers don't make a lot of money. So what we're going to do is we're going to pay farmers extra money for farming. Now, they're going to make money off of the crops they, they make, but we're going to pay them extra money for farming. And when we pay them this extra money, we're going to be real specific, and we're going to say, okay, dude, we're paying you extra money, so what I want you to do is I want you to make sure you grow certain things. Okay, that's cool. And then, because the farmer got paid extra money, they don't need to sell their crop as expensive. So that means for you and me, we go back to the store and the corn isn't quite as expensive. Okay, now here's the weird thing. We only subsidize frigging corn. Why don't we make carrots cheaper? Why don't we make celery cheaper or lettuce cheaper or anything like that? The stuff that's super healthy, we don't make cheap. What we make cheap is corn. Okay, now I have a farm and I can tell you if I want to make my cows nice and fat, I feed them corn. If my pig gets skinny and I want to make my pig fat, I feed them corn. So guess what? corn does to you and me. Okay? Pretty simple, pretty easy to figure out. If I eat too many corn products, I'm going to get fat. Okay? And if you go into the grocery store, I challenge you to walk through the grocery store and look at all those boxes and bags of things. Now, this is not the meat aisle. This is not the cheese aisle. This is not the vegetable aisle. It's all the aisles in the middle of the store. And tell me how many things you can find that doesn't have a corn product in it. Now, okay, here's the tricky thing. You've got to remember 
that the people who are making these products, they get real tricky and they rename things and they don't call it corn. Okay, so you got to look for those secret names. It's in everything. And all this food is making us fat. So again, I mean, this is just my soapbox and I'm just telling you, I don't understand why we don't subsidize carrots, okay? Because then maybe we all would eat carrots more. Okay, now I got to say one more soapbox thing and then we'll go on. The other issue I have is, okay, in the dark ages when I was a kid, food tasted good. Okay, like the carrots, they, they tasted really good. Apples, they tasted super good. And nowadays, everything sort of tastes like plastic. I don't know. It just doesn't really have a taste, not like it used to. And it's because of the way that we're farming. And it's because we don't have enough farmers. So these poor farmers, what they have to do is they have to dig up their carrots early. They have to pull the apples off the tree early so that they can ship them 3,000 miles away to feed you and me. And this stuff is going to rot when it has to be shipped that far for that long. If we had more farmers, if we had more people who could do this, maybe we'd all want to eat this food. Maybe we'd want to eat our vegetables. Maybe we'd want to eat apples. I gotta admit, okay, I'm just gonna admit this to you. I don't think I've eaten green beans in years because they're gross, okay? That's just me. I don't know about you. Maybe you have a special way of making them and I don't know what I'm doing, but to me, green beans are disgusting, okay? But when I was a kid, I lived in farm country and we used to go pick green beans and we would eat them right off the plant because they were so yummy. Now you're not supposed to do that. Okay. That that's bad. And we were dumb and we didn't know it. Luckily we didn't get sick. You're supposed to cook them first, but Hey, they were great. They were wonderful. So maybe we need to think about farmers and we need to think about how we can do this type of thing better so that maybe the rest of everybody will want to eat better. So, yeah, we need to subsidize and help low-income families, but we also need to help those farmers because a farmer's going to grow whatever you want to eat, and they're going to grow whatever their family needs them to grow so they can make money. I mean, duh, that just makes sense, right? So uh, there's some things that the government has come up with which are really nice. There are certain nutrition programs like Women, Infants, and Children, which is the WIC program, which can help uh, parents to buy the right kind of food for pregnant and breastfeeding moms and for the infants. And then there are, um, with WIC, you have to go to certain classes to learn things. They do health assessments. They teach you about nutrition, and then they give you the vouchers, and they make sure that the kind of food that you're going to buy with these vouchers are really high vitamin and mineral types of food. And right now in the United States, there's more than 8 million women, infants, and children who benefit from this program every year. Uh, there are many women who could potentially participate um, but they maybe don't know about it, they haven't tried, whatever, I, I don't really know. So increased nutrient needs to support pregnancy. Uh, Patrice required 2,200 kilocalories per day before she became pregnant. Now, I'm telling you, if Patrice is eating 2,200 calories a day, she's probably doing a lot of exercise, okay? How many calories will she need each day during her first, then her second, and her third trimester? Hmm, good question. I like it. What is optimal weight gain during pregnancy for a woman who begins pregnancy at a healthy BMI? We're going to talk about this. How does this differ for a woman who begins pregnancy underweight, overweight, and obese? We'll go through all of that. And then we're going to talk about nutrients that may need to be supplemented. And we've kind of touched this a little bit, but we're going to get more into why 
what's going on with the mom, with the infant, if they're not supplemented, okay? What, what are some of the issues? Okay, so in the first trimester, we're looking at you need just a balanced, adequate diet, okay? And let me just say, uh, adequate would be I'm eating enough calories where I'm not losing weight, but I'm not really gaining weight. Because in the first trimester, you really shouldn't be gaining much weight, okay? Um, and, and because, you know, remember that feed is teeny, teeny, tiny during the first trimester. So really, if you're gaining a couple of pounds, that's fine. Um, but most of that is uh, you're putting on some water weight. Uh, the uterus, which, by the way, pre-pregnancy, the uterus is about the size of a walnut. Post-pregnancy, the uterus is about as big as her abdomen, okay? It just stretches very nicely to fit that growing baby. So you don't need to increase your calories, although, again, I'm going to tell you that progesterone, which we call the hormone of pregnancy, is going to mess with your brain, with your hypothalamus, and say, eat, eat, eat. So you have to be careful of this. And if you're eating a good diet, okay, so low glycemic load foods, okay? Go back, look at the video we talked about with the glycemic index and the glycemic load. These are your more complex carbohydrates that are uh, low in... Um, carbohydrate load, which means that they're not going to spike your insulin, they're not going to increase fat gain. Now, in the second and the third trimester, you can start increasing the number of calories a day because baby's growing, it needs more energy, and usually you're looking at about 350 to 450 calories a day, depending on how physically active this woman is. And let, let me tell you, We've talked about, you know, walking your steps and having your 10,000 plus steps a day. This is really important to be doing during pregnancy. You need to be exercising. Because I'm going to tell you one thing, okay? Uh, especially if you've never had a baby before, you might not know how much muscle you're going to need to push that baby out, okay? It requires a lot of abdominal muscle, pelvic muscle, to be able to do this delivery process uh, without any issue. And so obviously that low glycemic load we talked about, those are going to be nutrient dense foods. And so an adequate weight gain is the best predictor of a good pregnancy and a healthy infant. Okay, stay active. Healthy women should get about 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic activity. That could include walking. Now, of course, you definitely need to be talking to your doctor about what kind of activity you're allowed to have. So if you've been horseback riding prior to your becoming pregnant, uh, many doctors will say you can continue to do that. However... Uh, you probably don't want to do a steeplechase, which <laughs> that would be very difficult. If you don't want to know what a steeplechase is, Google that one. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you're continuing this aerobic activity to increase oxygen, keep the muscles strong. This helps to lower insulin resistance and just helps the pregnancy all around. So the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, I can speak, recommend that pregnant women perform at least 30 minutes per day of moderate intensity physical activity. Okay, now, what they don't say there is that it doesn't have to be 30 minutes in one setting. You could do 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and 10 minutes. So you could walk 10 minutes in the morning, in the afternoon, and 10 minutes in the evening, and that will get you the same outcome as if you did the 30 minutes all together. Okay? That's pretty cool. We didn't used to think that. We now know that that is the case. Also, lots of water. Water, 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 water. Drink lots of water when you're exercising. You want to be very hydrated before. You want to be able to drink some water during. 
and after your physical activity. And I say lots of water because, you know, the average American drinks practically no water, okay? If it came to having a water shortage because we're all drinking, eh, ain't, ain't ever happening, okay? We just don't drink enough water in the United States. So you want to make sure you're increasing your water intake, okay? This is helping to regulate your body temperature to make sure that you don't get too hot during the exercise because any type of heat stress is really bad for the developing fetus. If you remember, if it gets too hot, okay, for a human, proteins start to break down. And you don't want anything breaking down in a fetus who's trying to build everything up at that moment. So you may need to restrict your activities, uh, especially if it's a high-risk pregnancy. Obviously, with anything that you do, you have to talk to your doctor about your limitations. So there are benefits to exercise. We've talked about this, and as far as the mom is concerned, uh, it prevents excess weight gain during pregnancy, improves the cardiovascular system, the heart, the blood vessels, lowers your risk for gestational diabetes, okay? You remember that one? Uh, so during pregnancy, well, we'll talk about this. I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, lowers your risk for gestational hypertension, which we're also going to talk about. Uh, reduced bone loss, because as I walk, as I exercise, any pressure that I put on my bones actually keeps my bones thicker, okay? I'm going to have less swelling in my arms and legs if I exercise, obviously, if I do it right, I'm going to sleep better. Uh, a lot of women have what they call a back pregnancy, where the baby is much closer to the back than sticking out the front, and so they can have a lot of back pain. The exercise stretching can help to decrease that back pain. And then, you know, if, if I don't get huge during pregnancy, I, I'm going to feel better about myself, okay? I, I don't want to feel huge. I don't, and it's just uncomfortable, okay? And for the baby, you know, uh, it decreases their resting, resting heart rate when mom exercises. The placenta is healthier. Uh, you have more amniotic fluid, which is very important to protect and feed the baby. Uh, it may improve brain development, keeps the baby incubating longer so you don't have a baby that's premature. And then we find that if mom exercises during pregnancy, baby, uh, as it grows, it's not going to be as obese. The baby is actually going to be thinner all the way through childhood. That's really interesting. So, optimal weight gain, again, about two to four pounds, that's not very much, during the first trimester, and then about one pound a week during the second and the third trimester. Now, keep in mind, this is for a woman who, during pre-pregnancy, had a normal, healthy BMI, okay? Average birth weight for baby, about seven, seven and a half pounds. Total weight gain should be between 25 to 35 pounds. Okay. Now that's not the average. The average weight gain actually for a pre-pregnancy healthy mom is about 40 pounds. Yeah, that's not that far off of the 35, I guess. Uh, 37 to 54 pounds carrying twins. I had a friend who she had twins, a boy and a girl, and uh, she, she gained 55 pounds. She was ginormous. Her belly was so big, I don't know how she walked. And uh, 28 to 40 pounds for a mom who was pre-pregnancy low birth weight. So before uh, she got pregnant, her BMI was below 20, the low 19.8. 15 to 25 pounds for a woman who is more obese, okay? And then 11 to 20 pounds for a woman who is, has a BMI higher than 29. Okay, so there is an issue called fetal macrosomia. And this issue is uh, found in obese mothers where the fetus can grow larger than average in utero. Okay, now, when we're talking larger than average, we're talking 9, 10 pounds, okay? Or potentially, I've heard up to like 13 pounds. Ouch, okay? Now, of course, the other thing is... This can be caused by moms who have gestational diabetes, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. 
And the baby, obviously, if it's going to be 13 pounds, there's a really high risk. It needs to be taken by cesarean section. And many times, if mom has gestational diabetes, the doctor goes, okay, so here's the thing. You've got gestational diabetes. The baby is most likely going to be ginormous. Uh, they're going to send mom to specialists who are going to constantly monitor her and look at the size of the baby using ultrasound. And then they're going to schedule a C-section and say, okay, two weeks early, three weeks early, we're going to take this baby. Okay. And they may, it may lead to increased risk of obesity and metabolic syndrome in the child. So this is the other reason why, mom, you need to be really, really careful with how you're eating nutrition-wise because you don't want to pass this on to your baby. Now, with weight gain, okay, where's the weight coming from? So, obviously, one of the things that has to happen is mom has to put on more fat, okay? And the reason she puts on more fat, we already said, is we're going to be feeding the baby. So, about four to eight pounds of the weight gain is from maternal fat stores. Now, this is obviously in a woman that's, 25, that's gaining 25 to 35 pounds, okay? So, we're looking at about 25 pounds right now, okay? So the uterus and the breasts are, we talked about, they're going to become larger. That's going to be about six pounds of weight gain. Mom is also going to increase, and we'll talk about this, the amount of fluid in her blood as well. And that's about four pounds of weight gain. And then the fetus, the placenta, the amniotic fluid is altogether about 11 pounds. The baby somewhere around seven, seven and a half pounds. So if you're gaining 25 to 35 pounds and you have this baby, uh, within just maybe about six months, uh, most if not all of the weight should be gone, okay? Because the uterus is going to go back to normal size. The breasts actually get a little bit smaller. Uh, you don't have as much fluid in the blood. And of course, there's no fetus, there's no placenta, there's no amniotic fluid. So when we look at the recommended weight gain in pregnancy and we're looking at pre-pregnancy BMI, we can then know how many pounds, or if you want to do it in kilograms, of weight mom should put on. So if she has a low BMI, less than 18 and a half, she should gain between 28 to 40 pounds, okay? If she's a normal BMI, like we said, 25 to 35 pounds. If she has a high BMI, 15 to 25 pounds, and if her BMI is greater than 30, she should only be gaining about 11 to 20 pounds. Uh, I did know a woman when I was uh, younger, and uh, she was grossly obese. She weighed over 500 pounds, and uh, she had had 10 children, and with every single one of the children, she never knew that she was pregnant, and she never had any type of birth pain at all. It was the most interesting thing. And she didn't gain any weight. So while she was pregnant, you know, she put on this baby and everything, but then I guess she would lose weight during her pregnancy, but she didn't know. I mean, she's a very large woman. And uh, all of a sudden she would have a little tiny bit of back pain and think that, I don't know, she hurt her back, she was sick to her stomach, whatever. And she'd go to lay down and a baby was born. A very interesting thing. Luckily, these children were actually all born very healthy. And here's the weird thing, okay? Um, her husband was very tall. He was probably like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, and stick skinny. And all of her children were born super healthy, and they took after dad. Every one of those kids got really tall and were very, very thin. So I'm thinking mom was like that probably because she had some kind of medical condition. Maybe a bad thyroid. I don't know. Something was going on in her life that she was obese like that. Because the kids did not pick that up, genetically speaking. So when we're talking about proteins, carbohydrates, water, we've kind of gone over this. But the recommended daily allowance for protein for pregnant women uh, is to increase it by about 25 grams a day. Uh, and then 
really, women are not good at eating protein, so you need to kind of look at it because sometimes there are some women who eat more protein, some women who eat less protein. I have a daughter who, trying to get her to eat any kind of protein, meat, whatever, is like pulling teeth. And she just doesn't like it. So we have to shove peanut butter down her throat. Uh, recommended daily allowance for carbohydrates is uh, increase about 175 grams per day. Of course, remember, we're talking about low glycemic index foods, okay? Not Cheetos. And most women already exceed that amount. So you got to be careful. There's, you don't get to eat a lot for 175 grams of carbs. That should be fruits and veggies. Fruits and veggies only. And then with water, you should be eating, or eating, sorry, you should be drinking about 12 and a half cups of water a day when you're pregnant and about 16 cups a day when you're breastfeeding. And that's an eight ounce cup, okay? So if you're breastfeeding, uh, not 16, eight ounces, that would be like eight regular glasses of water. So relative macronutrient and water requirements for pregnancy and breastfeeding. So you can see in this chart in blue are the uh, amounts for adult females, red is for pregnancy, orange is for breastfeeding. And obviously proteins, alpha linoleic acid, linoleic acid, fiber, carbohydrates, water, they all go up during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Sorry, wrong way. Come on, you can do it. There we go. Well, we're talking about lipid or fat needs. 20% to 35% of the total calories a woman is going to eat when she's pregnant should come from fat. And these fats should include, we've talked about this in previous lectures, linoleic acid, which is your omega-6, and alpha linoleic acid, which is your omega-3. You want to eat lots of those a day. 13 grams of omega-6, 1.4 grams of omega-3, because baby requires these fats for brain growth and for eye development. Super important that mom provides these. And we can get this from fish, okay? Especially, and here's weird stuff again. Uh, we're now farming fish, and the problem is, uh, when you farm fish, their whole metabolism changes, and they, they're, they're not as healthy, okay? And a lot of scientists have said, we think the reason that the fish are not as healthy, meaning they don't have as much omega-6 or omega-3 on their body, is because when they're in a farm and they're in this tank, there are no predators, and they don't have to run for their lives and their body doesn't have to make as much of this fat. And so if you're eating only farmed fish like farm salmon, which it's really hard to get Atlantic cold water salmon at the store anymore, most of it is farmed, uh, you may not get the omega-3s and omega-6s that you need. And again, here's issues with how we supply and farm our food, okay? This is another big issue. Of course, the other thing is, who thought of putting orange dye into the food that these fish eat so that the fish meat looks like it's neon stuff from a carnival? I don't get it. Somebody didn't think the pink color of salmon was pretty. They like orange better. I don't get it. Why do I need to eat that dye? Anyway, okay, another soapbox, sorry. Um, so eating fish at least twice a week is helpful to meet the needs. Try to eat something that's not farmed fish, okay? So vitamins, daily recommended allowance. Obviously, we need to increase our vitamins during pregnancy. Up 30% for most of the B vitamins, 45% for B6, 50% for folate. We already know that. Vitamin A, we need to increase it by 10%. And of course, most of your prenatal vitamins already have these amounts figured out. Doctor's going to recommend good prenatal vitamins, possibly even give you a prescription for them. 
Um, folate and vitamin D, most needs are easily met through diet, except folate. Kind of hard to come by unless you're eating a lot of your green leafy vegetables. And you need about 600 micrograms a day, again, for that DNA synthesis, fetal growth, and even maternal growth, because, you know, that uterus has to grow, placenta has to grow, and so on. We talked about it prevents the neural tube defect, but it also is helping mom and baby produce red blood cells. Okay, really important. Now, vitamin D, you need a minimum of 600 units or 15 micrograms per day. Um, some people recommend up to 2,000 units per day. So again, depends on what your doctor is going to recommend. Uh, dietary intake for uh, anybody is usually insufficient. Lots of people who are vitamin D deficient, okay? Experts, like I said, recommend at least 1,000 units a day. A lot of other experts are recommending at least 2,000 units a day. Uh, and that, what it's going to do is it's going to keep your blood sugar levels normal, your blood pressure normal, help to allow the fetus to grow normal, and it prevents rickets. Rickets are um, soft bones in children. Now, we don't really see rickets anymore. Like when I was a kid, there were kids who had rickets. And one of the things that you saw is they'd have like you call bow legs, and it looked like they'd been riding a horse. So their legs were rounded. And that's because their bones are soft. They don't have the ability to put calcium into their bones and harden the bone because they didn't have enough vitamin D. The reason we don't have that problem anymore is because we fortify our food with vitamin D, lots of different types of food. And that means we add the vitamin D, like especially to milk. We add vitamin D to milk. Now, another thing that's interesting is that vitamin D... Um, They've talked about, and we talked about this in a previous lecture, but they've talked about not calling it a vitamin because vitamin D also does a bunch of other things in the body. For instance, it uh, helps to control gene expression, meaning that it helps your uh, DNA and what's called your RNA, and it helps your cells to produce certain proteins, and uh, which is very interesting that a vitamin does this. It also helps to regulate your immune system. It helps to regulate some steroid production in your body. So vitamin D does a, a lot more than other vitamins do. So this is also just a little graph that shows you the requirements for the different vitamins during pregnancy versus breastfeeding. And again, in blue, you have just a normal adult female non-pregnant. In red, you have pregnancy levels that are needed. And then in orange, you have breastfeeding levels that are needed for each of the different vitamins. So obviously, during pregnancy and during breastfeeding, uh, the levels of vitamins go up. However, okay, notice real quick here, vitamin D. You don't need to increase your levels. If you have the right levels of vitamin D prior to pregnancy, those levels can stay the same. Um, but most women have to increase their levels because they're too low in vitamin D. Okay, now, mineral needs. Uh, if we don't have enough minerals, obviously lots of things can happen. Uh, we do need to increase these minerals during pregnancy. We've already talked about iron and zinc, but iodine also needs to go up during pregnancy. And we take this in the form of iodide, and you need about 220 micrograms per day. Now, this iodide is necessary for the thyroid and for the brain. So you need this to produce thyroid hormones, which then helps also in brain development. Uh, if So I have this baby that's growing, and one of the things that I need to do is I need to provide this iodide mineral to the child so that the child can grow. Uh, but if I'm not consuming enough, my thyroid can't make enough thyroid hormone. And so what'll happen is it just, it goes, oh man, I'm just not making enough. Let me try harder. 
and oh, I'm still not making enough. Let me try harder. Let me try harder. And what it does is it starts producing more and more fluid as it tries to make these thyroid hormones. And as it produces more fluid, the thyroid starts to swell. And uh, whether it's a little swelling or there's women who it really swells, this is what's called a goiter, okay? Now, one of the issues also is that that could be that mom is not producing enough thyroid hormone or let's flip it. What if mom's thyroid just goes wacko and says, hey, let me just make more thyroid hormone just for the heck of it, just for fun. And now she becomes what we call hyperthyroid and she starts producing more and more and more and more of this hormone, way more than she needs. She can also have swelling of the thyroid gland and she can also produce a goiter. So it could be she's hypothyroid or she's hyperthyroid. So either way, you can get a goiter. Just with hyper, well, let's go back to hypo first. With hypothyroid, the, um, the growth of the baby uh, is in question. And so baby can have all kinds of deficits because mom is not capable of keeping her metabolism going and her growth and providing the baby with enough growth. So you may have this very small infant who also has other type of uh, health issues because of hypothyroidism and now has a very high probability of becoming hypothyroid themselves. With a thyroid issue, mom can get a goiter either way. You can get a goiter from hypothyroid, you can get a goiter from hyperthyroid. But if you have enough iodine in your diet, it's going to prevent that goiter. And then here's the other thing, with enough iodine in the diet, mom's producing enough thyroid hormone, she's going to prevent what's called congenital hypothyroidism or what's also referred to as cretinism. Now, if you notice before I had hyperthyroid on there, oops, that was a typo. Sorry, I stopped and corrected that. So just to let you know. So cretinism, um, when you're looking at this baby, uh, they have typically profound mental retardation. I don't know if you could hear that, but the, uh, military was flying their jets over top of the house just now and my peacock just went crazy so in case you heard that that's what's going on anyway uh oh and by the way the peacock's name is kevin just so that you know my grandkids named him he's he's from the movie up okay all right so back to cretinism uh profound mental retardation they're very short stature children uh as you can see in this picture a protruding forehead and they have uh, very delayed motor development, so reflexes are slow, learning how to walk is slow, and then they have very coarse hair. These are some of the most profound symptoms of having congenital hypothyroidism. So you want to make sure your iodine levels are good. Uh, we've talked about iron and zinc, but just to go over it, for iron, about 27 milligrams per day. Now, that's for a healthy woman who has no iron deficiency, okay? Uh, if a woman has an iron deficiency, she may be taking much more than that. So she needs to be checked to find out, is my iron okay? Do I need more iron? Do I need to have take supplements? Now, let's say mom doesn't want to go to the doctor, whatever, um, a lot of times we can tell if we don't need to take as much iron because one of the issues that happens is uh, you start to, from excess iron, uh, a lot of women will become very constipated and they uh, produce this very black, tarry type of stool. And that's kind of a sign, oh, well, maybe I'm taking a little too much iron. But that, I don't recommend <laughs> using that as your way to discern if you have enough iron or not. Get checked find out if you do, okay? Uh, and of course, the other nice thing is if you do need iron and you start to take it, one of the things that usually happens is you see an increase in energy for the mom. And also, interestingly enough, it causes a decrease in appetite because 
if I'm tired because I don't have enough iron, I don't have enough oxygen, I can't make enough energy, my body goes, oh crap, okay, we got to have this energy or, or we're going to die. So how do we get more energy? Oh, I know, tell her to eat. Eat, eat, eat. Maybe if she eats more, we'll have more energy. So if I get enough iron and I'm able to provide my body with enough oxygen, I don't have to eat as much because I'm able to use that oxygen to create a lot of energy. You should be taking your iron on an empty stomach and that means like between meals or uh, right before bedtime but they also recommend that you take the iron with something containing vitamin C like orange juice which helps the iron to absorb better. For zinc the recommended daily allowance is about 11 milligrams per day and as we said this is going to support growth and development of the fetus. So use a prenatal vitamin and mineral supplements. Uh, again, any prenatal vitamins are going to have folic acid and iron in them and these vitamins and minerals are going to reduce uh, low birth weight, okay, or small for gestational age births. And they're recommended especially if someone's living in poverty, uh, teenage pregnancy, inadequate diet, carrying multiple fetuses, if someone smokes, uses alcohol or illegal drugs, or if they're vegan. A lot of times vegans don't know how to eat appropriately. So eating pattern for pregnant women. Um, list three nutrients of special concern for a pregnant woman who practices a vegan lifestyle. That's something to think about. Modify the 26 calorie daily menu that you see in your book. Uh, look for that in table 18.3 uh, so that it would be suitable for a pregnant vegan woman. Uh, Michaela tells you about her pregnancy craving for ice cream. She says she has been eating one or two ice cream bars after lunch every day and usually stops for a milkshake at a fast food restaurant on her way home from work. What nutrition information would you share with her? Hmm. Just things, again, to think about. So, physiological changes of concern during pregnancy. So, what diet and lifestyle strategies would you suggest to a pregnant woman who complains of morning sickness? Define gestational diabetes. What are the potential consequences of this disorder for the mother and baby? Differentiate between chronic hypertension and gestational hypertension. Define preeclampsia and eclampsia. So we're going to go through all this and talk about these as well. First, we're going to start with a big issue that a lot of pregnant women have, and that is heartburn. Okay? So heartburn, the causes are all about that hormone progesterone. Okay? So while she's pregnant, progesterone goes up. Progesterone helps to maintain pregnancy. Now, if you look at the picture, okay, this is your esophagus, the tube coming from your mouth, going down to your stomach, okay? And right here where the esophagus and the stomach meet, this area is made of muscle, and it's what we call an esophageal sphincter. Okay, so now this is a circular muscle. And what it has the ability to do is that when food goes through the esophagus, okay, this muscle, once the food enters into the stomach, that muscle can close, clamp down, shut, so that all the food can't get back up your esophagus, because that's gross. You don't want the food to escape back up. You want it all to stay in your stomach. Now, the issue with progesterone is it messes with that little sphincter, that esophageal sphincter, and it relaxes the sphincter so it can't close all the way. Now, once your food gets in your stomach, if you remember, your stomach starts to make acid. And that stomach acid uh, can now, because the sphincter isn't totally closed, it can escape into your esophagus and literally burn your esophagus. Now, because your esophagus is kind of close to your heart, uh, people have named it heartburn. It's not burning the heart, but it is burning the esophagus. And if you're laying down, okay, this is, uh, seems to especially happen with pregnant women who are laying down, uh, it can also go all the way up the back of the throat and into the mouth. So it could also burn the back of the throat, it could burn the tongue, it could burn the teeth, 
it could burn the mouth. And um, some women don't even really know that this uh, acid is coming back up or regurgitating while they're asleep, but they wake up with a, uh, a scratchy kind of sore throat. And that, that's one of the symptoms. So, <coughs> excuse me, uh, one of the things I recommend is uh, don't lay down right after you eat because all that food creates pressure in the stomach and if I lay down, it's much easier for it, because just because of the anatomy, for the food to come rushing up into the esophagus. Uh, don't drink a lot of fluids between meals because that also creates pressure and pushes things up. Uh, fatty foods, spicy foods, uh, even stress, high stress levels. Foods uh, that are very high in calcium could all cause heartburn in women. The woman just needs to kind of figure out what does and doesn't work for her. Uh, and then she may have to be prescribed certain antacids in order to lower uh, the actual level of acid in the stomach until the pregnancy is over. And hopefully the sphincters will go back to their healthy, normal, tight state after pregnancy. Because one of the other things that does happen too is when a woman's pregnant, obviously there's a lot more weight in her abdomen and that can also push up on the stomach and that can pop the sphincter open as well. So that progesterone, that excess weight can all lead to heartburn. Constipation and hemorrhoids are an issue for women too. So with constipation, uh, one of the reasons we see this is because um, in the large intestine or in the colon, the feces is having to move through that colon. In order for movement to occur, there are muscles around the tube of the colon that are squeezing and they're moving the feces through this colon. But during pregnancy, those muscles have a tendency to kind of get a little soggy, a little too relaxed. They don't squeeze as well, so the feces doesn't move adequately like it's supposed to. Also, as the fetus gets bigger, it could be pushing on areas of the colon and preventing the feces from moving. Or if she's taking excess iron, we talked about how that could cause constipation. Now exercise, believe it or not, seems to get those muscles moving and working a little better. Also, make sure that she's drinking lots of water and consuming fiber in her diet. Because remember, again, talked about this in previous videos, we can't digest this fiber. So this fiber ends up getting in the colon and fiber absorbs water, okay? So the fiber becomes part of the feces and now the feces with the fiber absorbs water and the feces is not as thick and it can move through the colon easier. Now, with this constipation, for some women, can come hemorrhoids. And hemorrhoids are due to, uh, a lot of it is due to the straining that a woman does to try to defecate, okay? And what happens is that puts a lot of pressure on the rectal region, and there are blood vessels in that area, and those blood vessels can become engorged, and those blood vessels actually can be pushed out of the rectal region and out of the anus. And now we have what are referred to as hemorrhoids and they really, really hurt. Now some women can also get hemorrhoids, uh, not during pregnancy, but after birth, okay, after what we call parturition. Uh, and that's because of all the pushing that she's had to do to get the baby out. Edema comes with being pregnant. Now you, you want as little edema as possible, but it does come with pregnancy. And usually uh, placental hormones are the reason that the woman is retaining water. And of course, you have to remember, uh, a lot of this extra fat and this water is cushion and padding for the baby so that it doesn't bounce on the uh, hit bones and hit on different things in the body and it's mu it's very cushioned in there and safe okay it also helps to increase blood volume we talked about that already 
and so some swelling is normal. So what you want to do is if the swelling starts to become too much, uh, tell the woman don't eat as much salt. Restrict the amount of salt in your diet because salt helps us to retain fluids, okay? Um, diuretics are, are not something you want to have to take during pregnancy. They're usually not needed for just mild edema. Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to make the woman pee more and get rid of that excess fluid. So really the only problem is if the edema is now accompanied by hypertension or high blood pressure and then we see proteins in the urine. That means something's breaking down, something's not working right. Okay, now nausea and vomiting are pretty common with pregnancy. 70 to 85 percent of moms will experience morning sickness in the first trimester. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in the morning, okay? You could be throwing up any time of the day. Some women throw up at nighttime, some throw up in the middle of the day. Uh, and we don't have a clue what causes morning sickness. Not a clue. So some remedies, although I have found that most women say nothing helps it except vomiting, okay, and then it goes away. But here are some potential remedies. Avoid nauseating foods or smells, although for me, <laughs> when I was pregnant, I, just all of a sudden the smell that yesterday was fine was nauseating today, okay? I remember one time going into an Arby's, <laughs> and at the time I loved Arby's, and uh, I just walked in the door, smelled what they were cooking, and that was the end. And I have not been able to eat at an Arby's <laughs> ever since. So just who knows? I mean, who knows? Uh, some people say to eat like saltine crackers, dry cereal, or something. Uh, it's called Zwieback Toast. Uh, that might help it to nibble on these things a little bit. Uh, av avoid large volumes of fluid all at one time. Eat small frequent meals. You know, who knows? I mean, again, it might work for you. Something, anything might work for you. Some people say mashed potatoes worked for them. I, I, I don't know. It, you just have to figure this out. But here's the big deal. If it's bad enough, you may need medication, okay? And luckily nowadays there is medication that isn't going to harm the fetus because you don't want mom to be vomiting so much that she's losing her electrolytes and losing her nutrition and baby's not growing appropriately and so on. So more about nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. Uh, the use of the following also has shown to help people with prevention. So some people don't have as much nausea and vomiting as others, and possibly it's because they are um, healthier at the time of conception, which is kind of an interesting thought. They're taking their vitamins, they're taking the minerals, and so the pregnancy is easier. I am not really sure. Uh, at the time of conception, they were taking their vitamin B6. And some people, before and even during pregnancy, they take ginger. Now, ginger is interesting because it has uh, been shown to be an anti-inflammatory. So some people can take this up to three times a day. So possibly that could help with morning sickness. Now, anemia. This is another issue that pregnant women could potentially have. So remember we talked about uh, there's going to be more fluid that builds up in a pregnant woman. Now she is producing a few more red blood cells, but a lot more fluid in her blood. So looking at this picture here, you can see the blood is made up of when you separate it out, okay? You take some blood, you put it in a test tube, and then you spin it in what's called a centrifuge. And when you do that, the red blood cells are the heaviest, so they settle to the bottom. The white blood cells are second, and they're sitting right on top of the red blood cells. And then the liquidy portion is on the very top. And that liquidy portion is containing hormones and fibers and different elements that are floating around in the blood. Okay, So this is the liquidy portion. We call that the plasma. And in a normal, uh, healthy person, you see the plasma on the top. Then you see the white blood cells here. Uh, and then you see the red blood cells at the bottom. But again, in women, the amount of 
plasma increases. So sometimes when you're looking at a woman's blood, you think, oh, holy cow, she has so much plasma and it makes the red blood cells look like there's far less. So sometimes the woman looks like she's anemic when eh, she still has the same amount of red blood cells, but she just happens to have more plasma. Now, the reason I tell you this is because sometimes with these pregnant women, um, they are given more iron and then they have all that constipation issue. So did they need the iron? Do they need the iron? Okay. So mom's blood volume is increasing about 150% of what's normal. That's a lot. And then the red blood cells, they do increase, but only about 20 to 30%. And so there's a lower ratio of red blood cells to plasma, which basically leads to what we'd call anemia. And this is a normal pregnancy response. So physiological anemia, normal increase in blood volume in pregnancy, it dilutes the concentration of red blood cells. So it's what we would call hemodilution, and that can result in what is referred to as anemia. And for some women, it's worse than for others. And it may, if it gets severe, require medical attention. So you're talking about anemia in pregnancy, and you have what's called an antenatal effect. And antenatal means anything that's happening before the baby's born, okay? So during, basically, the pregnancy time. Uh, anemia can cause poor weight gain, uh, it can cause preterm labor, and even preeclampsia, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Intranatal is during the labor process. So uh, you may have what we'd refer to as a dysfunctional labor. So labor is not going on well. Uh, she may be hemorrhaging, going into shock, uh, having cardiac arrest from basically anemia Okay, during this time. Postnatal means after the baby has been born. One of the issues is sepsis, and that would be basically a uh, infection, an infection that has spread throughout the body through the uh, bloodstream. Embolisms are also uh, potential danger here. To the fetus, okay, there is risk, of course, of premature labor, which means low birth weight. Uh, poor APGAR scores, which APGAR is showing how healthy the baby is. There's certain reflexes that can be done, certain things you look at to look at the health and the growth of the baby. Uh, because of the depleted iron store, the baby can be anemic during this period, and there is unfortunately a really high level of these children who have failure to thrive, okay, and poor intellectual development. Okay, so we talked a little bit, I just kind of mentioned gestational diabetes. Now, gestational diabetes is very insul uh, interesting, not insulin, I was just going to say that word. Uh, gestational diabetes is interesting because um, while mom is pregnant, her body starts to synthesize hormones, okay? Uh, it, this is the placenta that's doing this, and those hormones decrease the action of insulin. Now what happens is those hormones bond to the insulin receptors and they block insulin's ability to bond. And so basically mom has diabetes. She, she's making insulin. That's, nothing's wrong with her insulin levels. It's just that they don't have the ability to bond. And this develops in about 9% of pregnancies. Now, uh, you can tell this in very routine screening. Uh, you're looking for high glucose levels in the blood, or, and uh, you're looking for high glucose levels in the urine. You're also looking, because her insulin levels are going to go up, to try to bond to these receptors that they can't bond to. And anytime insulin levels go up, you're going to produce more fat on the body. So if I want to make you fat, I can think of two ways of doing it feed you a bunch of corn, or inject insulin into you, okay? Those are two ways I can make you fat. So, um, but here's the problem. With gestational diabetes, I may need to give mom insulin, and I may need to give her that insulin so that uh, what happens is she has a lot of insulin in her body, and the more insulin in her body, 
it seems to be able to overcome some of these hormones and so it can bind to more receptors and her gates can open on her cells and she can get glucose into her cells. So if I give her that insulin, then it's going to uh, obviously decrease the glucose levels in her blood, increase the glucose levels in her cells, she gets more energy. But if it's not taken care of, if gestational diabetes just goes on and on, I'm not taking, mom's not taken care of. Um, interestingly enough, you see a high birth weight baby, okay? Uh, and these are the babies a lot of times that you're looking at 13 pound babies. Mom, of course, has low blood glucose levels, okay? And uh, you may also see malformations in the baby as well. Now, a lot of times, uh, the diabetes, as soon as the baby is born, C-section or not, uh, the diabetes goes away. But strangely enough, this can be linked to diabetes later on in mom's life, okay? Not when she's pregnant, okay? Just a lot later on. Oh, by the way, let me just say one other thing. Nutrition-wise, with gestational diabetes, uh, there are a lot of people who believe that that can be hopefully controlled uh, with diet, okay? That low glycemic load diet, and then lots of exercise, long walks, plenty of exercise in mom's life, okay? Now, one of the other problems uh, with pregnancy can be gestational hypertension. And again, we don't really know what causes this. It uh, appears to be genetic in some cases, and it can appear after about 20 weeks of gestation. And it occurs in about 68% of pregnancies and if uh, the hypertension first appears after 20 weeks, that's when we call it gestational hypertension, okay? So mom could be a lady who already has high blood pressure before she gets pregnant, uh, but that's due to other things. This high blood pressure is due to being pregnant and goes away once she's not pregnant anymore. So these hyper, this hypertension can lead to problems and of course, one of the issues is if the blood pressure gets high enough, uh, it can cause convulsions in mom. Uh, you can have liver damage, kidney damage, uh, cardiovascular damage, and all of this, of course, leading to death. And um, intake of calcium, intake of vitamin D is involved in reducing uh, gestational hypertension. It appears to help to uh, cause blood vessels to dilate and to relax those vessels so that hypertension goes down. About half of women with gestational hypertension develop what's referred to as preeclampsia or eclampsia. Now preeclampsia is more mild, we'll talk about that, and then eclampsia is the more severe form. So if you're talking about preeclampsia uh, or eclampsia, either one, these are very high risk issues. And this is hypertension where we also see the protein in mom's urine. Now, uh, when somebody has preeclampsia, they may gain more weight, okay, than they should. Uh, they may have pain in their abdomen, very severe headaches, dizziness, trouble breathing. This is all because of the high blood pressure. Uh, there may also be excess anemia, okay, so, uh, excuse me, not anemia, excess edema, sorry, the swelling in the hands and the legs, the water retention. Now, this becomes another issue because the more water mom retains, the higher the blood pressure goes, okay? That excess fluid in the blood uh, can cause higher blood pressure. Now, keep in mind, excess fluid in the blood causes higher blood pressure, but also then that higher blood pressure pushes fluid into the arms and legs, and so you can have really severe swelling. And uh, we can manage a lot of this hypertension with medication, or if it's starting to get bad enough, we're talking about IV medications. Now, if it gets bad, really bad, now we're calling this eclampsia, and this is a severe complication, okay? You, you need to take care of this immediately. 
Uh, seizures can occur during pregnancy because of the high blood pressure, of course, headaches, excessive weight gain, and then a lot of that has to do with the water weight, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Now, especially in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen, you seem to see more pain. Uh, they can have loss of vision. And then, of course, this can also affect the baby because the blood vessels are constricted down. There's less blood flow through those vessels, so baby's not getting as much blood flow. Uh, the placenta isn't getting as much blood flow. And, of course, neither one of them are going to be healthy with that. When baby is born, they're usually born early, premature. They're low birth weight, and they're usually born with health problems, okay? Uh, it could be as bad as the baby also being stillborn, all right? So preeclampsia is not something to mess around with when you start having these types of symptoms and you start seeing all of this edema and buildup, uh, it is very, very dangerous for mom and for baby. And that's my grandson and my daughter, and they're doing Easter egg dying. I just love that picture. Well, it's been nice talking to you. I will see you again in another video. Take care. Bye.